He said, John, in 35 years in business, the reason I have more referrals and access and deal flow, the reason people love to talk to me, I'm the first phone call that people make, is I'm like trusted and top of mind. I figured out that if you take care of the family in business, everything else seems to take care of itself. So for me, as a 20-year-old, it was like this lightning bolt moment where it wasn't about the stupid knives, although to this day, our agency still does millions of dollars in the Cutco knives. It was about that, that the item itself was a delivery vehicle for an emotion. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, Nick Nanton here, and welcome back to Now to Next. We've got an awesome and fun guest for you today, uh, my friend John Rulin. We met maybe two, three years ago now, I think for the first time, uh, through our mutual friend Robin Robbins. I'd heard your name a lot. I'd heard sort of this word giftology. I wasn't exactly sure what it was, but today we're going to talk a lot about something the world needs more of, uh, not only as a business strategy, but just a life strategy, and it's radical generosity. Uh, I, it's a term that, uh, I got from you, so I didn't, I didn't make that up, so I'll give you the credit for it. Uh, before we get going, John, how's life, man? How are you doing during the pandemic? Uh, man, we've, we've actually been really fortunate on the speaking and the gifting agency. You know, fortunately, we've been able to, this will be our best year ever in 20 years, so. I'm uh, I'm super grateful that we've been able to shift and and uh, do really well. My four girls, I've got more time with them than I ever have. So um, even though I see a lot of people in pain, I mean my team is uh, you know been challenged with craziness like homeschooling and whatever else. Overall, I'm I'm really blessed. Awesome, man. Yeah, I, I feel similarly in that uh, it's just yeah, things are different for sure. Um, you know, I've been out on the road a little bit. I actually saw you in Austin a few weeks ago for at an event I went to. I've been out on the road a little bit, but it's been a total blessing with being, you know, I haven't been home this much since my oldest was born, you know, and he's 15. I mean, I, I have pretty... Uh, I have a pretty regimented travel schedule. We sort of have a checks and balances system because, as you know, it'd be easy to be gone, you know, 40 nights a month. Um, you know, I only do seven nights a month on the road, and if I'm gone for dinner, that's half a night. Uh, so we, we do have a system, but it's still been nice to be home just a lot. You know, like th after this, I've got two soccer games to go to, and I, I try to never miss anything. But, of course, uh, just the way life was, it's just, you know, you, you miss a lot. So let's talk a little bit. I, I think one of the – one of the most informing factors that I talk with people a lot about is how you grew up. Uh, it affects us no matter what. I mean, some of us need therapy for it. Some of us, you know, uh, you know, don't want to ever talk about it again. That's probably not a good strategy, by the way. But it, it definitely affects who we are and who we think we are. Uh, you were one of five kids growing up with uh, a father who who worked for a water treatment plant and your mom stayed home. Sounded like you didn't. It, it, it sounds like it was probably abundant with love, much like my upbringing, but not abundant with like lots of money and things. That's sort of my perception of reading reading through the book and the notes. So sh share more with me about your upbringing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm an Ohio farm boy. I grew up milking goats every morning. My mom uh, is one of 13 kids. I have 68 first cousins. <laughs> and so uh, we had a one acre garden. We bailed, you know, instead of going to Disney World in the summers, I bailed hay. You know, we had you know, basically we lived off the land and my mom could make five dollars go further than five hundred dollars. So I grew up garage sailing and, you know, wheeling and dealing for a dime. Like I'll give this for a nickel. And that, like and so, yeah, I grew up lower middle income um, I and mean, we didn't starve, but I definitely wasn't a kid, you know, rocking Air Jordans uh, or British Knights. Uh, that's that's an understatement. Um, and uh, I wanted to get out of Dodge. Our town was four hundred and seventeen people. And I wanted to make money. I was motivated to, to, you know, and so I was going to go be a doctor. That was kind of like my thought. My mom, before there was Whole Foods, was into health and wellness and shipping vitamins to our house, which was weird for a farm kid. Um, and so, yeah, my, my upbringing was definitely uh, one where I, I was hungry and wanted a different life than what I grew up with. Got it. I think that's many of us. I mean, that seems to breed entrepreneurism, uh, entrepreneurial ability. Um, my brother is, you know, grew up obviously in the same house that I did, although, you know, it's so funny. 
people, I think we perceive most of the things that happen to us pretty similarly, but it is interesting how our brains process things completely differently. Uh, he is a, uh, a child forensic psychiatrist. So, uh, definitely, um, I, what? yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I think he, I don't know what I did to him as a kid. He's older than me. So I guess he so did like more CSI? to me. Is he like, like consulting for like CSI? Like what, it, that seems, that's a big, it's a big title. Yeah. Uh, like what? That's, that's unique. He's boarded in four different specialties, I believe it is. And it, it really what he does, he spends his time, a lot of time in addiction and recovery, just because there's a lot of that, a ton of time in, uh, you know, and specialization in, you know, behavioral disorders and things like that. But the forensic side of it really comes into it, uh, when you're talking about typically anything with an adversarial proceeding, which is really mostly court. So it would be, um, sometimes it would be a, um, a court, a divorce, let's say, where a kid is saying that um, they don't want to live with one parent because because they've abused them. Well, unfortunately, sometimes that's not true. Like one parent has told the kid to say this, and so he sort of has to try to help figure that out. And then he also does like insanity defenses and things like that. So yeah, he um, I I trained him well. I trained him well to do what he needs to do. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's crazy yeah, stuff. Wow. So yeah. he's like basically a paid witness or expert to good d- dive in and find the truth. Yeah, exactly. And so super fascinating. I mean, I'm glad I, it's a heavy, heavy gig. I'm glad I don't have to do it. But, you know, the I knew when I, I sort of explained my story as, you know, I had more love than we could spend. Um, but we you know, were immigrants. Right. And so we were my parents were trying different things. They'd left sort of everything they'd known to come to, you know, to come to America and give me and my brother an opportunity. And a bunch of my uncles and aunts moved up at the same same time, all, all legally with papers. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm purebred. I have papers. Uh, and so, um, you know, but it's, you know, there, were, I, I recall about the time I was like somewhere between 10 and 12 when like the things you mentioned, the, uh, the Air Jordans, the, the BKs, like it, it all, things started mattering that to them, like in the grand scheme of Maslow's hierarchy weren't super important. But like as a kid, like my perception, like, I mean, thankfully we never starved, but like to me, these were important things. Like these are things that I wanted to fit in. Now, what's really unique as I'm sure you would agree to as we, get growing older in life it's actually those things that define us that make us different than everybody else when at that time we just want to fit in but all the things that make us uniquely 100%. different are the things that really you know give us the success in life it's just such a hard thing to get a kid to understand and far less understand like to process when they're living in it uh daily so yeah similar similar circumstances where i decided i want things how can i make money what can i do i started uh teaching tennis lessons i became a clown i, I did all sorts of, of fun stuff Stuff that uh, we could talk about at some point, but it's about you. I didn't know about the clown. I didn't <laughs> yeah. know about the clown thing. That's uh, that's uh, that's awesome. Most, I want to see that bit. I'll, I'll pay for that bit. <laughs> Most don't. I, literally, I was trying to find ways to make money to buy a car, and I was like, "What skills do I have?" And we had had a, a magic store sort of nearby, so I bought some magic tricks, like most kids. Somehow, I ended up with a balloon animal book. I can make balloon animals. Like I could do this. So at the time, I flipped through the phone book, and I just like I called this place. I'm like, "How much does it? I mean, how much does it cost to hire a clown for my?" My kid's birthday party and the guy's like 150 bucks an hour i'm like done so i hung up and i started charging like 100 an hour and it was like solid i mean i wasn't booked regularly but like i mean the money was good and so yes i i did that um all, we'll have all to i can the- think about is uh, is uh, is wedding crashers where like <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard. See, yeah, make me a bicycle clown. <laughs> like, that's like one of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes uh, from a movie ever. Like, yes, see, that's all I can think about. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, I used to when I thought it was funny. Um, when there was like a clown at a restaurant, I'd ask for a couple balloons. And I'd like out balloon the clown. But uh, my no! kids, <laughs> my kids started. You punked, it, you punked it, the clown. Yeah, it was like embarrassing them, which it, it should have been, but it, it, was, it was funny. So <laughs> your your mo, we'll, we'll have a clown name guessing contest at one time because it's a funny story i got my clown name but anyway um you started uh you a friend of yours was opening a branch for cutco knives and it is it is interesting in the world of entrepreneurship i do run across like a fair number of cutco people um i have my oh. own story about walking out of the cutco presentation actually um because i did answer the ad in the paper to go yep. you know for the ad for the for which, this career which, which, you, 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 yeah, you went to a seedy part of town. And you're like, this cannot be legit. 
It was, yeah, it was actually, and I know it's not, um, it's not Cutco. It's the salesman who was there and his high pressure selling tactic. And it was sort of like, it, it basically he, he was feeling his oats as a salesperson, which there's sort of that spectrum of, you know, as you know, like a salesperson of like, first you're like, I don't know what to do. So I like vomit. Then you sort of read books and watch, you know, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, whatever. And like, there's this point where there's a point in most salespeople's career where they, I think that ego is what it takes to sell and control of the situation as opposed to service. And so the yeah. best, the best people I know, the most successful people I know in business, clearly sales is a huge part of it, but it actually comes down to, I mean, in all the things that you and I'll talk about, but it comes down to serving the other side, like, like exceptionally well, like radically generously. And so this guy, I don't, most people never find that part of the spectrum. Uh, but, and I don't know if this guy ever did, but he was clearly in that ego side. And I was just, he sort of like, channel, like if you get up and walk out of this room right now, you'll never be successful the rest of your life. I'm like, Oh yeah. So I just got up and walked out. Like, it's, just, it's just like my, my like rebellious kid thing. When the ad wasn't real clear either, like you're going to be selling kitchenware and sporting goods. I'm like, mm, one fishing and hunting knife is not sporting goods. So I just felt, you know, I didn't feel like it was a, a it was an honest, Upfront. yeah, it wasn't honest enough front. So it was like, ah, not for me. Although knowing what I know about Cutco now, and I have a few of the knives and like great company, great training. So tell me, tell me more about Cutco because again, the, you, is it the system they teach you? Is it the, is it the, uh, is it the structure? Like, obviously, a lot of people do nothing with it and just quit. But the people I know who've made it, is it the pressure? Cook like, what is it that makes Cutco a good breeding ground for some people? Yeah, well, I think the product itself, I mean, most people don't realize it's like the Rolex of cutlery. It's handmade in New York. This year, they'll do $300 million in revenue, wow. which, you know, is a pretty sizable. In the cutlery realm, especially the high-end cutlery realm, they're like the, you know, they're the top. I didn't know what Cutco was when I went in. I was just desperate to pay for med school. And I think a lot of people, they have a division that works with college kids. And I think that when you start getting, you know, you have 20-year-olds that are getting exposed to selling a great product. They're getting exposed to a sales training program that tells you how to, you know, teaches you how to handle objections and set goals. And, you know, you're reading John Maxwell books at 19 years old and going to Tony Robbins conferences. I think that, A, they've worked with 1.5 million college kids in 70 years. Like there's a certain critical mass there of people. But I think that in my opinion, they're a knife company, but really they're a personal development company that understands how to pour into these young people that are very moldable. And, you know, like the, the guys that are leading the company are Christians. They're good dudes. Like they're like solid family guys. They're, they don't have helicopters and private jets. They're like flying around coach. They could have their, all that stuff, but they're not a, like, if you go to Ole in New York where it's headquartered, there's 850 people that are employed there. And they it's like the Cutco YMCA and the Cutco Gymnasium and the Cutco Theater. They really – they could outsource and make 10 times more money by having it made in China. But they've chosen to make this a multi-generational company that really cares about people. And there's actually Purdue, Michigan State. There's some universities that the program is so good, the training is so good. In order to graduate with a sales degree from those universities, you have to sell Cutco for a semester. That's a requirement. So like, That's cool. in my opinion, I think that if you can learn how to handle your own, you know, calendar goals, objections and sell, you can do anything in life. And that's why you got guys like Hal Elrod who wrote Miracle Morning, you know, is one of the best selling authors the last decade on a self-published book. John Levy, who runs Influencers Group out of New York. There's all these people that are running companies now that their original start, even the founder, whether you like him or not, the founder of Uber. Uh, Travis Kalanich, you know, multi-billion dollar company, his first job was slinging blades. It was selling Cutco knives. So I do think it is, it's the product, it's the training, it's the sheer number of people. And I do think that you either sink or swim. You either rise to the top and handle things really well and learn life skills, or you're like, you know what, this selling thing sucks. I'm going right. to go get a normal, you know, J-O-B and, and call it a day. Um, so for me, it was it was the, the launch pad for a lot of things. Got that. Yeah, most, most things suck the first time or the first time you try or the first time you do it like you know it's i mean lifting weights everything like it's it's i 
I got a new set of weights today because I've been waiting for them to come back in stock uh, since all the gyms and stuff shut down and all that. And my gym actually opened back up and then had like a huge flood. And it's like a massive gym that the Orlando Magic founder built and like it's a huge center. And they shut the whole thing down. Like they literally opened up I think like a week ago, I think. And so I end up getting, um, I got the, the Bowflex Selecta weights for home. You can select from 10 to 90 pounds. And like they're super cool, but like I was, I was working out with them the first time today. I was a little frustrated with like, um, they're just different than regular weights, but I had to remind myself like, Oh, within, within a month, I'll be like slinging these things around. It'll be like, it'll be just normal, but just like that friction of it being different. And that's the hardest part to get someone like to me for a kid, especially interestingly, we're talking about like developing, you know, young people, uh, really interesting that, um, one of the biggest things, if I can get a kid to see, like, you know, to understand like the hard things, if you can learn to work through the hard things, which is the hardest thing to teach a kid, or like if you can learn to earn your way off the bench in sports, or if you can learn to persevere and get through that math class and not like, there's so much value in life in that, that we see. I mean, it's like a mini Navy SEAL lesson, right? I mean, it's not, not nearly on the par of that, but like showing you, you can do something you didn't think you can do. And I feel like so many parents shortcut their kids learning those lessons because they just want to fix it for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, They don't have grit. They have no ability to, you know, it's a Jocko or any of the guys out there. It's like, whether you're Navy SEAL or not, like you have to do things that suck to get to do things that are amazing, whether you're an athlete or whether you're a sales rep or a CEO or a documentary maker or marketer, like we all have to suck. And most people, if they give up in the sucky part, like they don't get the, you know, the gold, the diamonds, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, our generation, the kids that I'm raising, my girls, like watching them suffer and, and, you know, like my daughter's playing basketball and she's not good. And I love basketball, but I'm like, you know, like she's crying, whatever else. I'm like, babe like this is part of the deal like i've had those days too where like it just sucks like you just want to cry like i've cried it's it's not fun but uh but yeah like letting your kids suffer uh a little bit i think is really powerful Uh, part of the deal uh so yes um and and by the way uh basketball story um i actually was I, I was relatively athletic, um, got some college scholarship offers to play tennis and for, I tore my knees and decided not to do that, but I played like four to five hours a day, all that mess. But I was so bad at basketball that, um, they didn't, I played one season in like uh, middle school and they didn't send me the renewal form in the mail. Like that's how bad I was at basketball. That's my story. At least maybe it got lost, but I, I was pretty convinced. I, I took the, I took the sign from above no matter what it was. Now, intentional uh, loss. <laughs> yes. Uh, I do have to say that I'm glad they're good Christian guys as, as you are, uh, and, and share the same faith. Um, but I, I, I still, I would still have the private jet. I'm just going to go on record saying that because, that just makes life so much better. I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. So I'm glad those guys are going coach, but I wouldn't be. No, I know. They're driving like Buicks to work. I'm like, I, they're just, they're engineers. They're just good. Like, you know, the one guy who's the CEO now, Jim Sitt Jr., like he loves Andy Stanley. Like, yeah. he's just, uh, he's just uh, like, they're, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm the same way. Like, I, I it saves me time. If it saves me access to my, my family. But, uh, but yeah, I'm with you. A little, little private jet here and there is not a bad thing. <laughs> we'll, uh, and we'll t- pick up on time, uh, as you point out in the book, Giftology. By the way, everyone watching, buy a copy of Giftology. I would say, in a lot of ways, it's not what you think um, when you just think of gifting. Um, and we're digging into some of that already. This probably, hopefully, already is not the conversation you expected us to have. Um, but so, uh, from Cutco, you, you met a really important person who happened to be the father of a girl you were dating. Uh, and, yeah. he, and he shared some pretty unique with you i think that perspective is unique share that with us yeah well you know when you grow up poor you notice when people are generous and paul was an attorney he owned a firm and but he was a rainmaker and it wasn't like the typical like glenn gary Gunn ross like he wasn't a fast talker he wasn't like the the guy that's like patting me on the back and buying me a drink he was kind like he was like this humble meek person that was all like he'd find a deal on noodles and buy like a semi load and everybody at church the next Sunday, like 200 people would walk away with a year's supply of noodles. And I'm like, Paul, that was like 30 or 40 grand. Are you nuts? And he just got this smile on his face. It's just who he was. It wasn't a tactical thing. And so I remember I, I was like, I, I pitched him the idea of giving away, you know, cut Kopaki knives. So, you know, all his clients were CEOs of million to billion dollar companies, insurance companies, financial advisor firms, home builders. 
and uh, they're all into hunting and fishing. And I thought he'll have mercy on me and buy the. And these aren't cheap pocket knives; these are like hundred dollar pocket knives. Yep. And uh, he changed my life forever. He's like, John, I don't want to order a hundred pocket knives. Could I order a hundred pairing knives? And I'm like, Paul, you want to give a bunch of grown men CEO dudes and VPs of sales and whatever else like a kitchen tool? I'm like, why? And he said, John, in 35 years in business, the reason I have more referrals and access and deal flow, the reason people love to talk to me, I'm the first phone call that people make is I'm like trusted and top of mind. I figured out that if you take care of the family in business, everything else seems to take care of itself. So for me as a 20 year old, it was like this lightning bolt moment where it wasn't about the stupid knives, although to this day, our agency still does millions of dollars in the Cutco knives. It was about that, that the item itself was the delivery vehicle for an emotion. And he was connecting to now what I call the inner circle. It was like the CEOs were getting treated and wined and dined on trips and whatever else. It was taking care of the, the spouse or the kids or the assistant. And so for me, I, I started to mimic those things. And I started to, I'd find a $200 million CEO of a company I'd want to get a meeting with, like an insurance company. And I, I'd hand write a note, you know, invest like 300 bucks in a Cutco carving set. I'd engrave the CEO's name and his wife. And I'd send it off and it said, carve out five minutes for me. I promise to be worth your time. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm in my dorm room. I send it off. Two weeks later, I get a phone call in my dorm room back when there were still phones in dorm rooms. And they're like, it's the CEO's assistant. And he's, and she's like, Hey, uh, Mr. Smith was really impressed. He wants to meet you next Tuesday at three o'clock. And I'm like, holy crap, I, I have class at three o'clock, but I'm like, this is the company I want to meet. So I'm skipping class. I wear the one suit I have on and I would go into these meetings and, you know, mahogany and glass and all that stuff. And this CEO's jaw like hits the ground. He's like, are you the John Ruling that sent me the knives? And I said, yes, sir. And he's like, man, I thought you'd be like some seasoned sales executive, like in their fifties. Like, I'm confused. Are you, are you here to sell me knives? And I would laugh nervously and I'd be like, no, sir, I'm here to help you and your 1,000 sales reps do exactly what I did to you to your top 10,000 relationships. And his jaw hit the ground again. He's like, you're good. Holy crap. And I walked out of there with an order for 1,000 knife sets. The order form for Cutco wasn't big enough to take the order. I sent it off wow. thinking Cutco was going to pat me on the back. And the CFO of Cutco calls me and says, John, we got your order. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking he's going to be excited. He said, we just want to know whose credit card did you steal? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, we've never seen an order this big. You obviously stole somebody's credit card and they're selling these overseas or on eBay. And I said, no, I'm, I'm like, I'm helping this company drive like 100x ROI on their relationships. And he's like, we're a knife company. What are you talking about? I'm like, no, you're not a knife company. I'm using your knives as this purpose. And it was at that point that I realized I was onto something. And that's when I put med school on hold, started the, the done for you gifting agency. And we started to really train and teach what I learned from this country attorney because nobody cares about gifts. Like I don't, I don't wake up and think about gifts, neither do you, but we all wake up if we own a company or lead a company or lead even a family, we think about relationships and the way you show up for a relationship, you know, it, it is really determining whether or not you value that person, whether or not they matter. And most people think gifting is swag and trinkets and promotional items and fruit baskets and bottles of wine. That's not a gift. Those are check the box tokens. Yep. And but if you show up and are powerfully for your wife or for your assistant or for your thousand dealers or whoever those people are, and people know you have their back, then they'll run through walls for you. They'll sell for you. They'll open doors for you. They'll refer business. They'll stay loyal to you. And most people think, you know, what we're talking about is like polo shirts with softballs. Like that's not a gift. Like that's a right. like that's a manipulation, actually. Yeah. Hey, here, go be an advertisement for me right. in my company. I, I did a, a million dollars with you last year. Here's your $47 polo with a logo. Like, that's not a gift. So the core of what we're teaching is really relationship building, kind of disguised as a like the gift being the delivery vehicle. Now, I don't even call them gifts anymore. I call them artifacts because gifts sounds like Harry and David pairs. Right. Like, that doesn't move somebody's heart. <laughs> that, that is true. Um, you have a great story as you were sort of – getting into this business deeper and deeper uh, with our mutual friend Cameron Harold. Tell that story for us. Yeah. So, so uh, like a lot of us, we, you know, like we're, we're one relationship away from changing our business forever. It could be a mentor, it could be an investor, it could be an advisor, a banking relationship, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, I went to, I joined EO after meeting somebody that owned controlling interest of 20 companies. And when I found out he was a member of EO, I'd never heard of it, but I just gave him my credit card and said, I'm going, I'm, I'm in. So I go to this Vegas, it's like their 20th anniversary and like Steve Wynn speaking privately and I hear Cameron speak and like everything that came out of his mouth was gold. I'm like, if I could get him not just as a client, not just as a coach, I, I can't afford his like $20,000 a month coaching, but if I could get him to be like a mentor, like a friend, like my life could change. 
So long story short, I found out he was coming to Cleveland where I was living at the time to speak to our local chapter. And like a lot of us, we're like, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's LeBron. Uh, it's open night for Cavs. Like I'm going to take him to a dinner and a ball game. And when I asked him to the dinner and a ball game, his response was the most underwhelming response ever. He's like, I guess I'll go. I don't have anything else going on. And so I'm like, duh, like every business, every industry, we do dinners, ball games, cigars, you know, glasses of wine. We, we, we follow the same playbook as all of our competitors. And then we wonder why nobody refers this business. We're, we're, it's vanilla. So on the spot, I'm like, Cameron, what else are you going to do when you're in town? And he said, I'm going to go shopping. And I'm thinking, this is my angle. Like, where are you going to shop at? And he said, I love Brooks Brothers. There's not a ton in Canada. I want to go to Brooks Brothers. So I said, hey, great. I want to send you a shirt size. What's your shirt? No, I'm a Brooks Brothers guy. Or I'm a, a Jose Bank guy. I want to send you a Brooks Brothers shirt. Uh, and, uh, and he said, uh, he, you know, he's looking at me like kind of like a bewildered. He's like, you know, does this dude have a man crush on me? It's like a weird question to ask another man's shirt size. But he told me and said, great, I'll send you a Jose Bank shirt. You know, I, you know, I've never tried Brooks Brothers. I'll try Brooks Brothers. So long and short is the day he's fine and he starts texting me, my flight's delayed. I'm not sure if I'm going to get in time. Do you just want to cancel? And I'm like, son of a gun. He doesn't give two rips about the ball game or the dinner. I said, no, even if you get in late, we'll just go for drinks. And so I call my partner. I'm like, Rod, we got to do this thing. And uh, Rod's like, do you believe in it enough that if it doesn't work, it comes all out of your personal draw? I was like, holy crap, that's a lot of money. But yeah, I believe in it. So I went to Brooks Brothers. I put down the Amex. I said, I want one of everything in your new fall collection, all your jackets, suits, belts, pants, everything. They ring up on the Amex. It's $7,000 in clothes. I go to the Ritz, ask for the GM, and we merchandise this hotel room to look like a Brooks Brothers store. Jackets here, belts, suits, pants. And uh, I'm downstairs drinking like a triple on the rocks. I'm not a big drinker, but I was so nervous because my partner's like, he's going to think you're a stalker. This is the dumbest idea ever. I can't believe you actually did it. And Cameron gets in. You can tell he just wants to go to bed. I said, Cameron, go take a shower. Come down when you're ever ready. He comes down 20 minutes later and his eyes are the size of silver dollars. He said, John, whatever you want to talk about for as long as you want to talk about, I'm all yours. I've never had anybody that's treated me and made me feel the way that you've made me feel. And so... Yeah, after that, for 10 years, once a quarter, I sent him a gift. I took the full cut code, $10,000 knife set. I sent him that over time for him and his wife. I sent him the $700 wine tool. I, I continued to send gifts to him. People are like, John, why didn't you stop after the Brooks Brothers thing? Like you had them. And I said, it's when you do things because you want to, not because you have to, that, that, that people, like if I wanted to get Cameron to be a sales rep for me, I, he wouldn't do it for $2 million bucks. But he's referred so much business. I did the math the other day. It's multi seven figures. So 20 grand turned into multi seven figures. That's a 50 X ROR return on relationship. And so, so many people miss out on the opportunity to have all of their relationships out there advocating for them actively, being actively loyal. But Cameron was the first one I realized, like you go, you don't, you don't hold back 5%. You go all in. And then you go all in again, and then you go all in again. And, and because of that, he's become one of the most valuable relationships that I've ever had in 20 years. I love it. I have so many questions, but they're all the wrong question, which I want to point out. Like so many people are thinking like, well, how do you get all the clothes home? And are you sure 7,000? Like just, but that like, and, and don't try to replicate that. That was, that's the whole, that's why it's the wrong question. You got to be thinking, what would make whoever I want to light up, light up. And the other key is, I mean, obviously you want to spend some time with them, but you, the most dangerous thing you could do in this scenario would be to give with an expectation of like, well, he's going to do whatever I want now because I just spent so much money. Like that will make you crazy. Ruins it. Yes. It ruins it. Yeah. So if you give a gift to your wife, Hey, here's a diamond ring. Now you now like we better have sex tonight. Like, how does that work out? But people do that in business. Yeah. All the time. We give a gift after a deal's done or because we want a referral or then we ask for a referral. Like, that's a bait and switch. Whereas if you love on somebody and continue to show up, I mean, Vaynerchuk made it popular with his jab, 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 right hook. It yeah. wasn't jab, right hook. Yeah. It was give, 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 and then earn the right after t over time to earn the right to ask. And that's why people are like, John, we do giftology. It didn't work. Or I do giftology. I'm like, no, you're... It's like baking bread. You think you're following giftology, but you cut a corner. It's like if you don't put yeast in, I don't care if you bake bread 10,000 times, you don't get bread. And if you do giftology and you do one thing wrong, you can completely, you can actually like, you know, I've seen people give out Rolexes and how, you think, how could you give a $10,000 watch wrong? But Domino's did actually down in Florida. They gave out, they put Domino's on the white face of the Air King. Even if you work for Domino's, do you really want uh, Domino's on your Air King? No, you don't. So putting a logo on it isn't a gift. That's a that's a promotional item, even even as a Rolex. So 
there's all of these little details in relationship building. It's like dating. Like you do something dumb, you might get broken up with or not get a second date. And then gifting is that way. Like people think, oh, like I'll just order it from Amazon. I'm like, are relationships automated to you? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, if it shows up from Amazon with no handwritten note, it just feels like you automated it. Yeah. Like that little detail of how it shows up, the timing. Like people think we're busy right now on the gifting side. I'm like, you think sending gifts between Thanksgiving and Christmas is going to earn you any brownie points? It's like those are – like that's table stakes time. That's like noisy, obligatory, expected giving. You should give gifts out of the blue. Even if you're sending the gift to 10,000 people, it should feel like they're the only ones receiving it because it's showing up out of the blue as a surprise and delight versus, oh, you gave me a referral. Here's your $500 bottle of wine. You ruin the gift, even ruining the timing. So it's uh, – yeah, the, the people ask themselves the wrong questions all the time and I'm like, you don't get it. Like this is like being thoughtful is not the same thing as checking a box. It's not. And people feel that emotionally if you're checking the box versus going all in. Uh, you just said a, a key point that uh, uh, those of you who have children like me hear way too much DJ Khaled. You said a major key, right? And so uh, I actually was thinking, you know, at the beginning of all of his uh, songs, it says, we the best music. I, I want to get the we the best podcast. Every time I come on, I want to go, <laughs> we the best podcast. So anyway, um, you said, you know, being thoughtful. And that is, that's the difference. You, you made the quip about like a diamond ring and a wife uh, for, for sexual favors. Like that is not being thoughtful. That is being callously manipulative. calculated, manipulative. Yes, uh, perfectly, perfectly stated. Um, another thing that I love that you talk about in Giftology is, um, and we're going to get into the book here in a second. Again, John Rowland, author of Giftology. Check out the book, buy the book, buy it for your friends. Uh, they will thank you. Uh, practical luxuries. This is a great distinction. Practical luxuries. Like there are so many things that are – practical luxuries that you may or may not buy for yourself, but like you always appreciate when someone else, it, when someone else gives you that little extra, you actually, I'll, I'll jump to it in the book. You talk about uh, buy the best in class for whatever amount of money you have a really great, really great point. You had a story about a fossil watch and a, uh, like a hundred dollar gift. Let's go into that a little bit. Practical luxuries and buying top of top of class, no matter what your budget is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of times people were like, Hey, what's hot, sexy. And I'm like, you know, when New York times interviewed us, I said the stupid knives and they're like, why? And I'm like, well, most people have this set. Even if you have a $5 million house, you have the set that you got when you got married. It's like this set from bed, bath and beyond or Nordstrom. It's, it's a piece of, you know, it's, it's worn out. It's a piece of crap. So, you know, to me, like finding something that people would never buy for themselves and, and knives are one of those things where most people have like the $20 knife set and you buy them one knife for $200. It's like melts their face off because they don't have a two hundred dollar knife, but they they might already have a Rolex or they might. Have, and so I see people like giving Apple watches to people that already have Apple watches or they already have a Rolex or whatever. And I'm like, your your five hundred dollar gift, like, what if you just went and did like a, a luggage tag for a hundred bucks? Most people eventually are going to start traveling again, and most people have a fifty cent luggage tag, and you right. buy them a hundred dollar one. It's actually better than the five hundred dollar like Seiko or Apple watch that you gave them because. They, you're going and taking a category that they would never buy for themselves, that they're actually useful. Like practical is a big part of it. People give gifts all the time that like hang on a wall or collect dust in a closet or on a shelf. I'm like, no, like if 2020 has proven anything, it's like we don't need more crap. We don't need more stuff. Like Goodwill, there's a line a mile long of people getting rid of all the tchotchkes and tokens and whatever else. But like, you know, like we had a client, well, you know Pete Vargas. Pete reached out and said, hey, I wanted to give a gift to Tony Robbins. He's a, a new partner of ours. And I said, Pete, I'm, uh, this is going to sound silly, but we're going to do a knife set. He's like, John, like, they already have like knife sets. I'm like, that, I understand that, but we're going to do the $7,000 knife set. And here's what's going to make it land. We're going to engrave on all 32 knives uh, one of 64 quotes of wisdom that Tony put out into the world. And so like, you know, even Tony like breaks bread with family and inner circle, but he already has knife sets. I get that. But we're, gonna, we're going to uh, capture his legacy and his life's work on these pieces and sure enough, Sage reached out and said, said uh, Pete, we already have lots of nice sets, but yours became an instant heirloom because we're actually going to use it. And every day we're going to be reminded of Tony's wisdom and his great grandkids are going to fight over this set someday. But we're going to like it's going to be a part of our family. And so, so many times people don't understand that like we like as human beings, we need things that are useful and, and we need to tie things that tie to our humanity. So there's so oftentimes people want to send out like another like, 
you know, hooded sweatshirt or a Lululemon jacket, and those are fine. But if somebody already has 10 of something and you don't ha find a way to make it unique and special to them, and you don't give the best in class of what they would actually use or even give better than what they already have, then you're wasting money. And, and then it's just a package showing up. And so I see people all the time that they're giving out the cool, hot, new, sexy gift, but it's like a water bottle. Like you can only drink out of one water bottle at a time. So like, you, like I've, I've had so many people are like, John, if I get another water bottle, my wife's going to divorce me. Like if I come home from another conference or another event and I come home with some piece of crap swag or even if it's a nice one, like I can only drink out of one and it has a logo on it. I'm never going to use that and my wife is pissed or my husband is annoyed. And so we find those areas like and, and we've partnered together on some of these crazy thousand dollar mugs. Mm -hmm. People are like, really, a mug for a thousand bucks? I'm like, most people have the one from China, you know, that says, I love you, dad, or whatever, like right. or the one that they got from South Carolina, at Myrtle Beach. We take a mug and carve into it somebody's life story. It's, so it's incredible. It's, yes. So it's practical. But when you make it a lifetime achievement award and make it the nicest, most thoughtful, most meaningful, like I've had billionaires cry receiving these mugs. We gave one on stage at a YPO event in, in front of five billionaires and the entire stage or the entire audience stood up, 100 people at this air that it was at a hangar and half the audience is crying. And this, this guy, Bill Lyon, who is, you know, publicly traded company, all this other kind of stuff. Every day he's going to be reminded as he drinks his coffee or tea that his life matters, that like, this is his legacy. So to me, like even billionaires want to be honored in a, in a certain way, but they also want something that's useful. And when you can blend both of those things together in a best in class gift, that's where you start getting like where people are like, if my house was on fire and I had to grab 10 things, I would grab that thousand dollar mug. Not because it's something that has a story and a meaning to it that's irreplaceable. And that's, you know, like you with the Rudy Rudiger, you know, thing behind you there, like there's certain things that capture the essence of who you are. And when you can take that, the practicality and, and uniqueness and blend it with meaning, now all of a sudden, like subconsciously, there's a trigger that's reminding people of the relationship that you have. And that's where referrals come from is being like trusted and top of mind. Most people miss the top of mind element. And if it's in a closet not being used, you're not getting the top of mind element that you're looking for. And you're missing out on so many deals and opportunities to trigger that memory and to trigger that opportunity to make an introduction. Uh, all, all incredible advice. The comments coming in are awesome. So many great nuggets. So many, just everyone's enjoying it. Again, everyone, John Rulin, author of Giftology and uh, and co-founder of, of Giftology. So should check out the company as well. Uh, this is a cool segue here. Actually, you're talking about Tony Robbins, who, by the way, uh, one of the most generous people I have ever not only met and spent time with, but ever, ever seen, uh, really incredible guys. So, um, I was, I was invited because we're filming something to Tony's home about two months ago, uh, when they were bringing some human trafficking victims that they had rescued that, uh, Operation Underground Railroad had rescued. Oh, uh, wow. and, and I, you would be like, Sage prayed over them and it was like, Mind blowing. It was, it was like uh, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. it. It was it was a special moment. Of course, my cell phone goes off in the middle. Of it. Like of course, me and Tony goes in the middle of the prayer. Yeah, Tony goes that right there <laughs> is 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 the sound. Uh, what he said that's the ring of freedom right there. And and so, but but I just you know I, I didn't even know I didn't particularly know their faith. But man, she she prayed like Billy Graham. It was amazing. So uh, moving into this next segment, you start a lot of your chapters with a Bible verse. Uh, and you make a very interesting connection um, about, you know, uh, about the Bible and giving. Uh, g give us that story. Yeah, well, what, what I think is funny is sometimes people, you know, of faith or not of faith will be like, man, John, you like this is like so amazing and so new. Like, where did you think of this idea? And I'm like, you realize like Proverbs 18, 16 says a gift ushers you before kings. Like, I didn't invent the idea of being a good gift giver or being generous, like it's been around for thousands of years, whether you're a person of faith or not, like the principles work because it's how God's wired the world. When, you know, when, when somebody does something really nice for us with no strings attached, guess what? God's wired us to want to reciprocate. It's like part of like how God's wired our DNA. It's what's why, like when somebody does something really thoughtful. So the core of like God is, you know, if you are a person of faith, like God's the ultimate gift giver. Like he give us life. If you're a Christian, you believe like, you know, like Jesus, like one of the cross is the ultimate gift to forgive our sins. Like the idea of being generous and not holding back and doing things not because you have to or out of obligation or like, like doing things that are unreasonable. Like the idea of like, like 
like forgiveness is is an unreasonable thing. It's a gift that we don't deserve. Grace is a gift that we don't deserve. So the idea of like I see so many business leaders of faith that might be generous in their personal life or in their church or charity life, and then they wear a different hat in business and they wonder why their relationships aren't flourishing. Like you know, you see like Chick Fil A, like they're crushing the competition. Why? Because they get, they're generous. They're incre- like the way that they serve people makes them outperform McDonald's by like 10x. And nothing against McDonald's, although I'm not a big fan of their food, but like the idea of being able to be radically generous, people think it's a warm, woo-woo, fuzzy thing, but the Bible tells us that we reap what we sow, and oftentimes if we do it the right way, in the right, like, like with the right intentionality and the right heart, it comes back to us a hundredfold. Now, it may not always be with the referral or the deal or within the day that you want, but you know, Gary Vee made it sexy, and other people have talked about playing the long game. The long game is decades if you look at the Bible. The long game is not days. We think that if we give, we're going to get. Like That's not how it works. But God does honor the things that we do, the seeds that we plant. And even if you're not a a Christian, like the Old Testament talks about the idea of being generous and tithing. And and it's frankly one of the numbers that we use as a kind of a reverse tithe is 10% of your net profit should be reinvested back into your relationships. And it's not just as a check the box to feel good at Christmas. It literally, I've seen where people get a thousand X return on relationship by pouring back in. And you show me a Facebook ad campaign or anything where you can pour, you know, a dollar in and get a thousand dollars back out. It's only, it's only with God and with the idea of being generous to people. Like, like there's no other thing out there. And so when people talk about it as being like this, like frivolous, like, oh, just be generous and this like cold hands and sing Kumbaya, I'm like, the companies that are crushing their competition, look at Southwest. They lo- like what's their methodology and system? It's love. Starbucks is, is radically like they're not necessarily a company of faith, but they are radically generous in how they treat people and how they show up with benefits and whatever else. Like to me, if you want to be successful as a leader, you have to pour into your people and gifting is just one of the five love languages. And I think that it's a scalable love language. I, I, Gary Chapman, who wrote the five love languages, is a mentor of mine, and him and his wife love giftology because they're like, it's based in biblical truth. It works because God created it that way. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, it, you can use it. I think it's better when you have the right heart and intentionality behind it. Yep. But this is a business principle like any other leadership or sales or John, like John Maxwell is a client. The reason he's a client is because he believes in the biblical ideas of pouring into people. We just happen to do it with tangible gifting and thoughtful, you know, tangible artifacts. But generosity works in any part of the world. It works in Idaho. It works in Africa because, you know, it's a biblical principle of humanity. I love it. And also, it, it also really works when, you know, there's, I've heard a few people say this, but, you know, it, it's not about giving back. It's about giving. Like when you took something from somebody, you don't get any great joy in giving it back to them. So let's get some of that out of the, like, the regular vernacular of the world. Like when you give, just give, like give generously, give radically, just give. And I, I can certainly say without, any hesitation. The times in my life where I have given with truly without expecting anything, I have been rewarded so richly with just, I mean, everything from mindset to relationships to like, you really do gain so much, uh, from giving that I, I just, I highly encourage you. We could, we could talk about the biblical side of this all day. Maybe we should at some point, but, uh, we'll, we'll move on a little bit. Just know that's a big piece of the, the foundation of this. Um, A a really interesting distinction that you made in the book that I think a lot of people miss. Um, you asked, you were asking your employees to deliver a a Ritz Carlton experience, a top shelf experience. And, and most, I'm guilty of this. Most of us have never stopped to think, wait a second. Do my employees even know what it's like to have a Ritz Carlton experience? Have they ever had that experience? Because, I mean, that experience, let's be honest, is because of the price of it is reserved for, for people who make a lot of money usually very high powered executives or CEOs or just wealthy people who are born into wealth. And so for most of us, people who work with and for us are, are growing their, their lives and they probably have never, very likely have never experienced that. So we often ask them to give an experience they've never experienced. So uh, share with that and, and share your solution to that. I thought it was a cool one. Yeah, well, it, it, you, you teed it up perfectly. I mean, I, we realize that with our own employees. And so many people with gifting, they get excited about giving a prospect, like their dream 100, you know, like 
Russell Brunson and and uh, you know, frankly, the um, uh, the ultimate sales machine, Chet Holmes, kind of made it popular to go after your dream 100 clients or prospects. But I tell people like you can't like go and treat people out here like the Ritz Carlton and then treat your employees like the Motel Six. Like that's an incongruent. Like it creates bitterness and, and, and your employees will be pissed off and they, they've never experienced it. So to me, taking care of your internal client, which is your employee first, is where to start so they can deliver the level of service that you want and they're excited about thinking like my employees give out gifts all the time that I haven't, I'm not even aware of because we've empowered them and showed them what's it, what it feels like to receive a Ritz Carlton level gift, not just experience, but also gifts. Like I send when somebody interns for me, I'll send a three, four dollars set of headphones to them during final saying, hey, I want you to help you block out the noise so you can study. And people are like, three or four hundred dollars for an intern? And I'm like, you guys are idiots. You'll go spend sponsorship dollars and do all these dog and pony shows and spend thousands of dollars to recruit somebody. Why would you not like recruit them as they're interning with you and love on them and show them what it feels like? Like nobody brags about their 401k or their health insurance. Like people will brag about how they feel treated and taken care of. And so I send gifts to my, it, my, the spouses of my team. This year during COVID, we started to send, we started to realize my employees are stressed. They're all working at home. Our, our employees have been working at home for a long time. And I'm like, they're not getting good night's rest. And they can't go buy the level of mattress that I might buy for myself. What if I just started sending them like $5,000 mattresses to say, hey, we want you and your spouse to get a good night's rest. We know it's stressful. We're in your corner. Oh my gosh. Like people freaked out and they're like, and, and I have, uh, you know, like Google and they're like, really? $5,000? I'm like, when you hire an employee, you'll give a salary range of 65 to 75 grand. That's a $10,000 delta that you'll bring in to overhead labor all day long and not think anything of. I'm like, why don't you budget and think about strategically how you can show up for your employees? Like we pay to have all of our employees' houses clean, which people think is insane. I'm like, it costs three grand. It gives us $30,000 in value because it gives our employees time back to do hobbies and spend time with their kids. They don't feel guilty. So to me, like if you don't start internally with your people first, you create this disconnect with, oh, if you're a client and paying money, then you're valuable. But if you work for us, you're not quite as valuable. And they don't, most people don't realize that when you do things and spend money a certain way, you're communicating value. You matter, you don't. And when you do that, even with clients, I see people that like the assistant gets the junior varsity level gift and the CEO gets this gift. For me, the way I got the Orlando Magic as a client was I treated the CEO, Alex Martin, the same way in the same level gifts went to Cheyenne, the assistant. Because of that, Cheyenne got us all of the other divisions of the Orlando Magic without me ever asking because she felt treated like a peer, not a pawn, not a gatekeeper. And employees the same way. I want our billion dollar clients to be getting gifts at the same level as my employees. And when I do that, they're inspired to go take care of things. I, we don't micromanage. Like we, we really want to focus on them owning the process. And they're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Like there's times I drop the ball, they drop the ball. But I think that when you show up powerfully and generously for your people and for your clients, they like givers get a pass. Like they get the benefit of the doubt. You don't have a target on your back as an employer. You like people want to see you win. And I think that taking care of your team that way, okay, we all have bad days as employers. We all have things that break. We all have things that go wrong. But when you take care of your team that way, like we don't have an, we don't have a loyalty or engagement problem because we've chosen to invest there first. Uh, I love that. And so we're, we're winding down here and so many nuggets here and we're, we're just getting to like the tip of the iceberg of what's in the book. So again, check out the book giftology, John, if someone is watching, so this is, this is not just a, this is not a campaign. This is a way, and not even just a way of thinking, it's a way of life. And so I think, you know, what you're showing through that is, is you actually would probably create larger problems for yourself if you only were to implement this for your top end clients and not your team. Or, I mean, just, just think it through. I mean, because it's very, it's a radical departure from most thought. But when you think it through and you live it holistically, uh, I'm not nearly on the level you are. So I, I got work to do, but I, I, do, I love the thought process process. And I know, um, I know you won't have the results if you're listening to this, if you just do this a little bit. So I, I don't want you to be misled by going, Oh, I'm going to send my top client a $10,000 gift. He's going to love it. Or, Oh, I'm just going to get all my employees, $5,000 matches. Like, again, you got to be thoughtful. Like they might've just bought one. They might, I, whatever. So you, you literally have to think this through for yourself. So for someone who has yet to read giftology, but is about to go get it and read it. Um, what, 
give me like the top first two, three, four things you can, you should start thinking about in order to make this, uh, manageable. Because, you know, like I have, I have 3,600 clients in 63 countries, like, right? Or over the, the past decade, we've served those people. Um, it could be overwhelming. So like, where do we begin? Is there a way to systemize any of it? Maybe not the thoughtfulness, but where do we begin? Yeah. Well, I would say that if you have a, you know, I don't care if you're a $2 million company or $2 billion company, most people have a marketing plan, a PR plan, a ops plan, a, a sales plan, a financial plan, a workout plan. Most people don't have a relationship plan. They've never taken the time to do a 360 degree view and said, hey, who are all the important relationships I currently have or have had? Who allowed me to get to this point in business? Is it mentors, advisors, investors? And just take, you know, the five minute journal is a great example of like, just take, a, you know, five minutes a day and write down three people that you're grateful for. If you did that in business, in the course of a year, you'd probably have a thousand people that you're like, wow, without them, I wouldn't have this deal or this referral or this investment or, you know, I, that, they're a key employee or whatever it is. But just documenting and, and acknowledging up here, like, hey, and here, like, there's a lot of people that have poured into me to get me where I'm at as a business owner or leader or division leader. Like putting it pen to paper is a, is a start. And then what I would say is that most people want to start with what to give. And that's like the seventh step in the process, who you're taking care of and the value of those relationships. Most people have never put a math equation together to say, I have a $5 million company. I make this much. How much am I reinvesting back into all of my relationships to keep them, to grow them, and then to turn them into what Cameron was for me, which is a sales rep, an advocate, a loyalist. And so I think if you can start the list, and then start to put like a dollar and cents beside them. If, if your tribe wants to go download like our whole blueprint and playbook of who, when, why, how much, and then finally what to send, they can, anybody could be a great gift giver. Like if a farm boy who is milking goats growing up can be, and love, my love language, by the way, of the five isn't even gifting. I'm an introvert who loves words of affirmation. And when I give a gift, I get the words of affirmation. It's allowed, it's allowed me to connect with these power players, even though like, I'm like reserved in this farm kid. I use gifting as a way to be able to dominate as an introvert because I'm not the life of the party. And the idea that I even speak on stage now is weird. It's like God has a sense of humor because I would get diarrhea six months leading to any speaking engagements. I was that nervous. So I, I would say start with writing down the list. You got to start, you know, it's like anything else. Go download the, the playbook at giftologysystem.com. There's, you know, no cost to that. And then start taking baby steps. You know, maybe it's just starting with your, your spouse and becoming a more year round thoughtful gift giver to your spouse or to your kids or to your parents or to your mentor. Like I have college kids reach out. And they're like, oh, I can never do giftology. I'm like, I budgeted as a college kid $500 a month to do gifting. Wow. Now, maybe it's just $500 a year that you decide to do it. And instead of doing like calendars for your top 500 relationships, pick maybe two people that are really important to you and spend 250 if you took a client out to a nice dinner with wine, you'd spend more than $250. Like, that's just the bottom line. Yep. If you pick up a bar tab in Vegas and you're a startup for 1000 bucks, like, take that $1,000 instead of buying alcohol that nobody remembers the next day, and maybe you buy, like, five $200 gifts. Or maybe you don't have money to do that at all, and you realize that the handwritten note that goes with the gift is just as important as what you're sending. That's what provides meaning and context. So oftentimes, I tell people, if you can't do a gift... Take an hour and write the most thoughtful note that you can of gratitude to that person. And then if you want to, if you want to cry and have that person cry, go read it to them in person. Like you'll both cry and they'll never, they'll never forget or ever get rid of that letter. Because at the end of the day, like I don't care who you are, we all crave for our lives to matter. We all, all crave to have meaning. And yet gifting isn't spending more money than your competition. It's being more thoughtful and creative. And whether you have a budget of a thousand dollars or ten million dollars, it's a matter of how you deploy that thoughtfully, year-round, holistically, not tactically, but saying, I'm a giver and I want to build this into my relationships for the next 50 years. Like when I saw Paul at 60 years old, I was 20. I'm like, I got 40 years to get to where Paul's at. And so I'm, I'm just turned 40 this year. I'm like, I'm, tw I'm halfway through and I built some pretty great relationships, but I still got another 20 years to go to get where Paul's at. And that's where things start to compound, you know, it starts with three relationships and then it gets to 10 relationships and then it gets to 300. And now like we have so many people advocating us for us in different parts of the world that like some of the referrals that are coming in, I'm like, I can't believe I'm talking to Microsoft or Google or SAP or I'm like, this is crazy. Like I literally grew up like 
thrift store in it. And people are like, you know, paying us six figures sometimes to speak. I'm like, this is just weird. This is nuts. This doesn't make any logical sense. And it really doesn't. But it's when you make those deposits consistently where, you know, over decades, it starts to come back. I love it, man. Uh, everyone, check out the book, Giftology John Rill, And Thank you so much for joining me here on Out of Next. I look forward to seeing you uh, in person next time soon. Thanks, brother. Take care. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.